Okay. I'm ready. We're already live. Here. Those are the know your rights. Well, it's not that one. And then my own cards, just in case. Yeah. This is exactly what I'm going to just pass these out now. Okay. Go ahead. Start passing them out. Hello, everyone. Welcome. You guys can help yourself to some snacks. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a little awkward if you guys can later. Hello, hello. Hi. About to get started here with a special edition of Know Your Rights in Columbus, Ohio, at the Ohio State University. Let me know when we can get started. We're going to have to manually edit for you. That's fine. Is that, that's okay. So maybe. Well, yeah, because I'm not going to be going slide by slide anyway. Oh, okay. So, so you, you guys can, don't even need it? I don't need it. I mean, this is more for everybody afterwards. So you can kind of go kind of scrolling through it as I'm speaking. You, I don't need it. Oh, so this is just for the information to district. Okay. Right. Because this has a whole lot more than what I can cover okay. in the short amount of time that we're here. Are you live? Are you sure? Okay. I'm just waiting for the green light to get started. Maybe I'm a little bit too far up. People can't walk between the chairs and. Hello, everybody. Can I get your attention, please? I don't want to do the OH thing. <laughs> no, but I will. Um, so, welcome to LSA. If it's your first time here, thank you for coming. If you're returning, hey, what's good? You know me. I'm Sophia. Um, yeah, we have a really good presentation for you guys. I'm going to let Isa introduce our speaker, and we're going to get started. Hi, okay, I'm Isa. Um, our first speaker is attorney Luis Valencia. He is a founding partner in Valencia and Diaz Law Firm with a focus, oh, um, with a focus on the Hispanic immigrant population. He will be discussing immigration in the United States and different rights we will have, so please stay tuned. Thank you. Um, okay, so just real quick, just out of curiosity, a couple quick questions. Does anyone here not understand English? Okay, does anyone here not understand Spanish? Okay, all right, then we'll do it in English, just making sure. Uh, also, anybody here, and, it, and if you don't want to say it, it's fine, but anybody here willing to raise their hand and tell me if you have a non-U.S. citizen in your family? Okay, all right. So let me first tell you just a tiny bit about myself uh, so that you kind of understand. I'm an OSU grad myself, go Bucks. And when I got out of law school and I moved to Cincinnati as a married man, I didn't know what I wanted to do um, with law because I'd, I'd always thought about doing trial work, but trial work and married life with kids doesn't really go well together because trial work takes up a lot of your time. So I ended up falling into doing real estate work which is incredibly boring to do. It's just paper, but it's really easy and it made me a boatload of money. 
I, I kid you not. I mean, I can honestly say the money came in faster than I could spend it. Now, Hispanics would always come to my office because all of my family's from Colombia. I'm the only one in my family that was born in this country. My brothers, my cousins, everybody was born in Colombia. And so they would always show up at my office because of my name and say, can you help me with this? And I'd say, I don't do that kind of stuff. And I'd send them out somewhere else. And I would always send them to some other attorney. And I remember it was either 2004, 2005, one of the two, when one particular gentleman came to me. And I couldn't tell you today if he was Mexican, Honduran, whatever, I don't remember, right? But he came and he was having a problem. It was a criminal matter. And it wasn't a big criminal matter, but it was one. And it was in the greater Cincinnati area. And I told him, I don't do that. Go to this guy. He came back a day or two later. Oh, he doesn't speak Spanish. Oh, the racism, the discrimination, you just don't understand. And I said, okay, then go to this guy. And he came back a day or two later. Oh, my God, please, you got to take my case. You just don't understand the racism, the discrimination. And I said, okay, then go to this guy. And he came back again. And this time he was almost in tears talking about the racism and discrimination. I was born and raised in Cincinnati. I grew up there. I went to grade school there. I went to high school there. Um, it is my home. And, and I've never had a problem in Cincinnati that I thought or recognized was a problem. And I said, okay, fine. I'll take your case. And I honestly took it with the sole intent of proving him wrong. I went to that court to prove that he was wrong about the racism and the discrimination because I knew the judge. I knew the prosecutor, and this was going to be a slam dunk because it wasn't a big deal. And I went to the court, and in those days, that judge would have a pretrial conference in his personal office with the defense attorney and the prosecutor to talk about the case. So I went in, and it was, hey, Louie, how you doing? Because that's how they know me. Everybody in Cincinnati my entire life has always called me Louie. He's like, hey, Louie, how's it going? How's the wife? How are the kids? You play any golf? And just small talk for like 10 minutes. And then one of the, uh, the judge said, so who do you got? And I honestly don't remember, Gonzalez, Hernandez, one of those, right? And the judge goes, fucking illegals. Why do we have to do this shit? And the prosecutor says, right? They don't have any rights under the Constitution. He's going to be deported anyway. They're all a bunch of fucking drunks. And they just kept going on and on and on for 10 minutes straight. And I just sat there with a dumb look on my face and my jaw on the floor because I'd never heard these people speak that way. I'd known them for years. I'd played golf with them, I'd done different. I'd never ever seen them or heard them speak this way before. And it's the first time in my life I can honestly say I, I couldn't think of what to say. So after 10 minutes I got up and I left and we didn't resolve the case and I got into the car and as soon as I sat down in the car I started crying uncontrollably, couldn't stop. And I called up a friend of mine um, who happens to be African-American. I grew up with him. And I'm like, man, dude, I'm so sorry. He's, I'm like, I, I thought I understood. I thought I knew what racism and discrimination was. I mean, I, I consider myself a very intelligent, very educated person. I studied a lot in grade school and high school and college. I studied everything about slavery, about the Holocaust, about the civil rights movement, about the women's rights movement, about all of those things. And I considered myself knowledgeable about that stuff. But I realized I had no clue what racism and discrimination was until it was smacking me in the face. And he said, the only thing that's gonna make you feel better is to go home and hug your kids. So I did. A Couple of weeks later, resolved the case. After the case was over, I said, can I approach the bench? And I walked up, the prosecutor walked up and I looked at the judge and I said, you know, I'm Colombian, right? And he looked at me and he said, I thought you were Italian. And that was his only comment. And I left. I walked out of the courtroom. I got in my car. I called up the office. I said, from now on, any Hispanic calls with any problem, I don't care what it is, we're taking the case. And over the next six to eight months, I realized that the 27, 28 employees that I had in my office, who were all, you know, uh, U.S. born, Anglo-Saxon, Protestants, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, a lot of them hated dealing with Hispanics. And they told me that. Within six months, over half the office quit. And they told me, can't stand dealing with these people because, and, and they're right about this. We don't show up on time. We never do. We show up without an appointment. That happens a lot. 
We cannot tell you what we had for breakfast this morning without starting at the Big Bang and working our way forward. We talk a lot. So they quit. And I ended up firing the rest over the next year or two. And I ended up hiring almost all Hispanics in my office. And now 98, 90% of my clients are Hispanic. And I represent them in everything that affects their immigrant status or everything where their immigrant status is affected by whatever case is going on. And, and th those are two very different things and not everybody understands that. And I will tell you, I make about one fifth of what I made when I was doing real estate work, but I feel so much better about what I do and, and who I am. So I've been doing that for the last 15 years. So what, what do I mean when I say that it can affect your immigrant status? Well, first of all, we got to understand what an immigrant is. And a lot of people don't understand that because people think an immigrant is anybody that came to the United States from another country, but that's not true. That is not true. An immigrant literally means somebody who is coming to the United States to live here permanently. So there are many people that are here on a student visa. That's not an immigrant. That's a non-immigrant. They're a foreign national. They were born in another country, but they're not an immigrant. Okay. So you have to be clear about that. What is their intent when they come here? And then, of course, obviously, the non-immigrant is the person who isn't intending to stay here. Now, things can change. Things can always change. They can end up coming here as a student and falling in love with Susie Snowflake, and now they want to live here forever. Okay, that's fine. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. They've changed their mind. But their intent when they came here was as a non-immigrant. Okay, so we've got issues where your status can affect your rights. An easy example. My wife is now a U.S. citizen. I met her when I was in Colombia visiting family and friends. She's now a U.S. citizen. If I die, I can leave her up to $4 million tax-free, no problem, because she's a U.S. citizen. If I'm married to her and she's not a U.S. citizen, if she's a green card holder, what, what people call that, or lawful permanent resident, I can only leave her $125,000 tax-free. Uncle Sam takes a big chunk out of the rest. Okay? So there's a diff, and that's just one example. As a U.S. citizen, you can smoke a joint, and if you get caught, it's a $150 fine. You don't even have to go to court, and that's it. If you're not a U.S. citizen, including, again, green card holder, lawful permanent resident, this is a deportable offense. If it's your second time, it's an automatic deportation, and there is no defense for smoking a joint. So there are things where your rights are affected by your status. By the same token, there are things that affect your status. So you might be married to a U.S. citizen and you may have obtained your papers through that marriage and the divorce could cause you to lose those papers. An easier example is think of somebody that's here and I'm sure you guys have got many multinational companies here in Columbus that bring people over on a work visa from their country. When they come here, the primary worker is usually on, uh, you know, an L1 visa is an example, could be an L1. That person's spouse would be an L2. That person's child would be an L3 so that they can study, so that they can live here, whatever. If they get divorced, the L1 can stay, but the L2 has to leave. Okay? So there are things where your immigrant or your status can be affected by things that happen here. So we represent people in both of those things. And you know, Alejandra and I were talking about this and, and we talk about it all the time and people don't understand what their rights are. And what you what you need to understand, first of all, is immigration is administrative law. We don't talk about it in that sense. If you listen to the propaganda, if you listen to the news, if you listen to all of these outlets, they don't talk about it in terms of what type of law it is. It, it is administrative law. There's three types of law in this country. There's criminal law. Everybody understands that. You commit a crime, you could go to jail. You could have to pay a fine. There is civil law. This is all about the money, honey. Personal injury, slip and fall, right? Uh, breach of contract. It's all about the money. Then there's administrative law. Everyone in this room is living administrative law right now. Why? Because you're in school. Administrative law. School is a perfect example of administrative law. If you get in trouble when you're in school, your first judge is the dean, right? Now, is he an actual judge? No, he's your judge, but he's not an actual judge. If you don't agree with what the dean says, you can appeal, but you've got to appeal to the board of education. Is that a real court? Is that a real judge? No, 
but it's your judge because it's the administrative system. If you're still not happy with the, what the Board of Education says, you can now appeal to a real court. This is called exhausting your administrative remedies. You are not allowed to go sue in court until you've gone through every one of the administrative channels. You can't skip those channels. Immigration is the exact same thing. Immigration is administrative law. So think about that. We talk about illegal aliens all the time. You hear that word all the time. Does illegal in any way, shape, or form mean civil law to you? No. When you hear the word illegal, everybody immediately thinks criminal. You know, oh my God, he's a rapist, he's a murderer, whatever Trump said, all of those things, right? That's what people think. But immigration isn't criminal law. It's administrative law. So they can't be an illegal alien. It is not a term within legal immigration work. It is a term in the general public, but it's not a term within immigration work. So what happens then? When an immigrant has a problem or when a foreign national has a problem, they have to go through the administrative system, which means that they go to the immigration, and we call it immigration court, and I hate that. And we call it that word, why? Because that's, it feels good to the public. The public likes that word. And here in Ohio, we've got one immigration court. It's in Cleveland. So anybody and everybody that is being threatened by immigration to be removed from the country, and that's the actual word, removed. It's not deported, okay? There, there are words that get used in the public that are not actual words in law. And it's important that you learn the actual words. So to, if somebody, if immigration wants to remove a foreign national, they have to charge them with committing some offense that makes them removable, and they take them before the immigration judge in Cleveland, Ohio. And again, this would be the equivalent of a dean. If you're not happy with what the immigration judge says, you can now go to the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is in Virginia, which is like the Board of Education. So again, not a real judge. If you're still not happy with them, you can now finally go to federal court, and you can now finally sue. Okay. The, what is important about that is, is that the immigration judge and the Board of Immigration Appeals are part of uh, the Justice Department. So because they're part of the Justice Department, they're part of the executive branch of our, of our government. They're part of, or excuse me, the legislative branch of our government. So Jeff Sessions, our attorney general, last year when he, two years ago, over the last two years, when he put out decisions and he said, Immigration judges are no longer allowed to dismiss cases. So if an immigrant or if a foreign national comes before an immigration judge and the case doesn't warrant that person being deported the, or removed, the immigration judge cannot dismiss the case. So then what happens? Well, he gets ordered removed unless somebody else can come in and save him and take him out of the immigration court because that's all that immigration judge is allowed to do because that's what Jeff Sessions said he could do. If you appeal that, it goes to the Board of Immigration Appeals, you're still stuck with what Jeff Sessions said you had to do. You have to get to the third case. You've got to get to the federal court before you can actually defend yourself. So you have to think about that in terms of what foreign nationals have to pay, what it costs them to be able to defend their rights inside the United States. They have to be able to afford to go through three legal processes. They've got to be able to go through the immigration court, then the Board of Immigration Appeals to finally get to a federal court to finally have a chance. So why does this matter? Why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because you guys have got foreign nationals amongst you all the time, classmates, friends, family members. What are the obligations? What are the rights? And everybody I'm sure here has already heard about the term ICE. ICE is Immigration Customs Enforcement. Basically, it is the police department inside the United States. That police department within the United States belongs to the Department of Homeland Security, which means it belongs to the president, which means that Donald Trump gives ICE orders in terms of what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, how they're going to behave. And it has nothing to do with what the law is because there is no law. It's kind of like campus police. Campus police do what the university says that they're supposed to do. Do they follow the exact Ohio criminal code? No, I'm sure that they don't. I don't know. I haven't looked at what their code and their rules are, but I'm quite sure that there are some rules in Ohio State that are not rules outside of Ohio State. Same concept. So ICE is not actual police. They are immigration police, but they're not actually police. They don't follow the real law. 
So then we talk about ICE detainers or warrants for people's arrest is what people call them, right? In the public, they say he had a warrant for his arrest because he was a deportable alien or he was a deported alien or he was an illegal alien or whatever they call it, right? So they use the word warrant. There is no such thing as warrant in immigration. There's a detainer, but there's no warrant. And if you read the detainer, the detainer literally says, we have no idea who Jose Hernandez is, but hold him for 48 hours while we figure it out. So think about that. ICE is asking somebody to hold another individual for 48 hours while they figure out who you are. Can the police hold you for 48 hours while they're figuring out who you are? No, they cannot. If they don't have a reason to hold you in that moment, they have to let you go. ICE is asking for 48 hours to hold you while they figure out who you are. Even more stupid than that is if, let's say, you have actually committed a crime, you drug dealer, and you get sentenced to 20 years in jail. You do the 20 years in jail, and right when you're getting ready to leave, I says, eh, hold him for 48 hours while we figure out who he is. And the jail oftentimes will hold you. I say oftentimes because not all jails in the United States are doing this. And this is not something that is well talked about. But there have been lawsuits against jails for following ICE detainers. And federal judges have held, held meaning have decided, that the county jail or the state penitentiary violated the individual's rights by holding them for 48 hours when they had no legal right to do so. So there are some jails that have stopped doing this. I don't know of any in Ohio that have stopped doing it. By the same token, I don't know of a federal court in our jurisdictions that have come down with that decision. The closest one to us that has made that decision was in Chicago. Okay. Um, so people are getting held without a legal right, without a legal cause to be held. And that's what these ICE detainers are for. And the problem is, is that when you, law enforcement, police officer off the street, hears the word detainer, he automatically thinks warrant. So he automatically thinks this person has a warrant for their arrest because they've done something wrong. Unless he gets educated by coming to a seminar like this or going someplace where he gets educated about it, as far as he's concerned, that person has a warrant for his arrest until he learns and gets educated that it is nothing more than an administrative law detainer, which is a request to hold the person, not an order. There's no judge. What's more, hope this never happens, but if you are ever confronted by an ICE official and you ask to see a copy of the warrant or the detainer, and if they have the guts to show it to you, take some time to read it. About two thirds of the way down the page on the right hand side is where the signature should be. And you can look for that signature and underneath it, you will see administrative official. You won't see the word judge. No judge signed that warrant. Think about it. That's like the police signing their own warrant to come arrest you. That's illegal, that can't be done. The police have to take the evidence that they have against you to a court, to a judge and say, your honor, this is the evidence we have against Jose. Will you sign a warrant so we can go arrest him? Will you sign a warrant so we can tap his phone? Will you sign a warrant so we can go search his home? And the judge decides whether yes or no and signs it. And you have a right to see that warrant. You see it in all the movies. They show the warrant to the person. The person looks at it, reads it. There it is. You know, it's got my home address. It's got everything. ICE doesn't have a judge's signature on it. That warrant, that detainer has no legal value. This piece, this, my business card is just as legal as, as a warrant as theirs is. None. There's no legal right to that so-called warrant or detainer. So when confronted with an ICE officer who says, you have to stay here, or I have a warrant for your arrest, or I have a warrant to enter your home or whatever. Yeah, let me see it. It's not signed by a judge. Come back tomorrow when you find a judge that's willing to sign it. They won't be back tomorrow because no judge is going to sign it. No judge is going to sign it. But people don't understand that. People don't believe that. They believe, oh, it's ICE. It's, it's, you know, it's immigration police. I have to do what they say. They'll ask you to identify yourself. They'll ask you to give them your, your uh, ID card, your passport, your green card, your whatever it is that you have on you. 
they don't have the legal authority to request request those things if you're walking down the street. Now, if you're at an airport and you're getting ready to get on a plane, now they have a right to see your ID, right? But you're walking down the street, you're driving a car, they don't have a right. They don't have a right to pull you over when you're driving your car. Do they do it? Yes, they do. So what should be starting to come clear to you as I'm speaking about this is it seems to me that ICE is doing a lot of things that they don't have a legal right to do. Yes, they are. They're doing a lot of things that they don't have the legal right to do. There have been lawsuits against them. Not enough. The law is a very slow moving machine. But not enough. Primarily because it is so expensive to do these lawsuits because you have to exhaust the administrative remedies. You've got to go through immigration court. You've got to go through the Board of Immigration Appeals and you've got to get to a federal court. So it is very difficult to find somebody with the money and the wherewithal to go through all three of those lawsuits. So this is a problem. So when thinking about ICE, when thinking about your friends that are foreign nationals, you have to start out with the concept and the understanding that ICE does not have a right to stop you. They don't have a right to ask you questions. Now, the warrant issue is really important. Because not because of whether it's signed or whether it's not signed. It's because of when does this come into play? And it almost always comes into play either when somebody's driving their car or somebody's at home. It's rare that it happens out in the middle of the road, in the middle of the street. It happens in one of those two areas. And what is so common is somebody knocks on your door and you open the door. And you should never do that. We teach our kids not to open the door. But we forget, as soon as we get a little bit bigger, that that rule should apply to us as well. The minute you open the door, whether it's ICE, whether it's the police, whether it's the FBI, whether it's whoever it is, the minute you open, physically open the door, you have given them the right to enter. That's what the law says. If the door remains closed and you say, who is it? And they fill in the blank. They say ICE, or they say Columbus PD, or they say FBI. Okay. Don't open the door. What do you want? We're here looking for Jose, or we came here to search the house. Okay, don't open the door. Do you have a warrant to do what it is that you want to do? Yes, we do. Open the door and we'll show it to you. No, 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 no. Pass it to me under the door or bring it to the window and show it to me at the window. Never open the door. And you look. Is it signed by a judge? Yes, it is. Open the door. It's not signed by a judge. Yeah, it's not signed by a judge. We're not opening anything. You're not coming in. If it is signed by a judge, the next thing is, is, is the information correct? Does it have your address correct? Does it have your apartment uh, number correct? Does it have the correct name of the person that they're looking for? Complete, spelled properly. If all of those things are true and it's signed by a judge, you have to follow it. If those things are not true or it's not signed by a judge, it's a meaningless piece of paper and you can ignore it. It is important to know your rights. By the same token, we're talking about college students. Many of you share apartments. Two, three, four, eight people to an apartment, right? And usually, hopefully, everybody's got their own bedroom. That's the next step. If, you know, you live with Jose and he's got his own room and it's closed and you open the front door and ice comes in, that does not give them the right to enter Jose's room. If you open Jose's door for them, they can go in. So opening the physical door means a lot, whether we're talking about home or whether we're talking about the car. If you open the car door, once again, you're giving them these reasons. Now, oftentimes you'll hear the Columbus PD or whatever police say, please step out of the car, okay? You can ask why politely. Nobody has to be rude about this. You can ask politely why. If you're going to step out, be sure you close the door behind you. You know, if they ask, can we search the car? No. Do you have a warrant? What? Do you have something to hide? No. Do you have a warrant? You don't have a warrant. You don't have a reason to be searching my car. Okay. Because you never know what somebody's cell phone is up here. It's yours. <laughs> That's ringing away. That's okay. <laughs> Um, you never know what somebody may have inadvertently left in your car. Might have been you, might have been a friend, whatever. 
don't let anybody search your car. That's a really bad idea, right? So again, we're, we're keep circling back to this. What does all of this mean? This means that today, in today's world where we are living, where we're sitting, the individuals who are working in what we know is the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, are violating the laws. There, there's no question about that. You can read article after article after article about this. You can talk to attorneys that work in this and you will read story after story about this. They're violating the law. And you might think, well, how come this hasn't been stopped then? I mean, come on, don't, don't, don't kid me. This, this couldn't be going on for this long and not be stopped. Well, yes, it can. And the problem is, is because who is the victim? Who's the person that's being affected? It's foreign nationals. Foreign nationals who don't always have all of the ability to defend themselves in this country that they should have or the willingness to defend themselves in this country that they should have. And history has told us that anybody that's being discriminated against, anybody that's being mistreated, it doesn't last for one day. It doesn't last for one week. It doesn't last for one month. It lasts for decades or centuries until somebody stops it. And the somebody who stops it is not usually the person who's being abused. It is the other people who stand up and say, enough. We are not going to allow you to continue to abuse this person, whether we're talking about African-American slaves, whether we're talking about women, whether we're talking about Jewish people, whether we're talking about any fill in the blank, any one of the numbers. This does not stop until the other people in the room say enough. This has to stop. So it is your job to educate yourself about what is going wrong in your country. What is currently being abused in your country? And I got news for you. This isn't something new. This is like the flavor of the month. The flavor of the month this year happens to be Hispanics. You know, before us, it was women. Before that, it was African-Americans. Before, you know, there's always somebody. There's always been somebody. It is a really great thought and a really great concept that we are a country made up of immigrants and that we are everybody. Every man is created equal. But only those people who refuse to look at history believe that that's actually true. When the Constitution was written, we said that everybody was created equal. That only meant if you were a white male. Those were the only ones that were created equal. Nobody else was equal. No one. The whole reason that Trump right now is so pissed about the birthright citizenship, right? If you're born in the U.S., you're a U.S. citizen. Does anybody know where that law comes from? Anybody? Really? Please tell me. No one? No. Right. It is what gave slaves the right to be human beings in the U.S. Before that, the famous Dred Scott decision out in St. Louis said that slaves were chattel. Chattel meaning property. They were property. You could do whatever you wanted with them. They were not a human being. It was not until we amended the Constitution and said, no, if you're born in the U.S., you are a U.S. citizen. And we did that because of our end of slavery, that they finally stopped being chattel. And that is what now causes somebody who's born in the United States, no matter where their parents came from, no matter what the immigrant, uh, the status, immigrant status, non-immigrant status of their parents are, gives them the right to be U.S. citizens. It's the only thing. And this is constant, you know, people talk about immigration and, and let me back up a little bit then and give you a little bit of a history lesson on this. As if immigration law has always existed, what you have to understand is, in all honesty, the birthright amendment is considered the first immigration law, not because it was written for immigrants, because it wasn't, but it's the first law that actually affected immigrants. Before that, there was nothing that dealt with immigrants, nothing, because it was all doors open, everybody come on in. Right. After that, it wasn't until the late 1800s. What happened in the late 1800s? Railroads were going out west. What happened with the railroads? Most of the work that was being done was being done by people from China. What went out west with the railroads? Shanty towns. What was going on in shanty towns? A lot of drinking, a lot of prostitution, a lot of substance abuse. We didn't like that. 
that was bad for the image of the United States. And we decided that it had to be the fault of the Chinese. So therefore, we created a law that limited the number of Chinese that could enter the United States. That was the second immigration law. The third one was not until after World War I when we started limiting the number of Europeans, Eastern Europeans, that could enter the United States. The next one wasn't until after World War II when we started limiting the number of Jewish people that could enter the United States, the number of other Europeans that could enter the United States. The next one wasn't until after the Korean and Vietnam Wars when we limited the number of Asians that could enter the United States, East Asians, and we started talking about in individuals that are born overseas to a U.S. citizen. Why? Because so many U.S. military men had children in Vietnam and or Korea who were left behind with no rights to ever come to the United States, so created an exception for them so that they could come over. That's another one of the rules Trump wants to get rid of. He hates the idea that you could have a child in another country and that that child could claim to be a U.S. citizen. Is that going to affect Vietnamese and Koreans? No. Who's it going to affect? U.S. military men stationed abroad. If you have a child born abroad, even if you're married, that child under Trump's proposal would not be a U.S. citizen. You and your wife get stationed overseas, have a child, and your child would not be a U.S. citizen. Think about that. Now, funny thing, in all of this conversation, by the way, in case you don't know, going through uh, Vietnam War, we're now into the 1960s, I have not once mentioned Mexicans or Hispanics. Why? Because there was no rule or no law about Latin Americans until 1972. Now for you guys, that was a long time ago. For me, I was already living and breathing, okay, running around, playing soccer, doing other things. 1972, that was not that long ago. Trust me, I'm not that old. Not that long ago. OK, that was the first time we started limiting Latin Americans coming in. So, so far from the beginning of the United States through 1972, we had no immigration law. We had a law regarding birth. We had a law regarding Chinese. We had another law regarding Europeans, Asians, now Latin Americans. But we had no immigration law. When did immigration law come into play? 1986. Ronald Reagan. It's the amnesty that all the Republicans are talking about now. The amnesty that they don't want. The amnesty that they keep threatening the world with. If you agree to this, this will be amnesty and we will be overrun by immigrants. But it was their godfather, Ronald Reagan, who did amnesty. Okay? That was the last one. And what's happened since then? Really? Okay. What's happened since then? Nothing. No laws. None. Zilch, zero. Everything that Trump has done have been executive orders. Executive orders means it's not a law. Executive order means it can only affect the agencies that are under the president's control, which is the military, which is defense, which is Department of Homeland Security. It's the only thing it can affect. It doesn't change the law, but it affects those agencies, and it can be changed by the next president, or it can be changed by him whenever he wants to change it. That's an executive order. So when he talked about King uh, Barack Obama doing all those executive orders, Trump has done like 10 times more than Bar Ob Barack Obama ever did in his short period of time. They haven't gone very well because almost all of them have resulted in lawsuits in federal court. And in almost all the cases, the federal courts have said, no, no, Donald, you can't do that. Your, your, your racism and discrimination is like shining through really big. And that is what is going on with DACA, which DACA is one of the important things for you guys. You guys may know people that have DACA or may not realize that you're friends with people that have DACA. But DACA is for people that were brought here as a child by their parents, unbeknownst to them many times that they came here without inspection. And by the way, that's the proper word, without inspection, not illegally. That doesn't exist. There is no such thing as coming here illegally, it's coming here with or without inspection. Those are the words. So brought here without inspection, unbeknownst to them, have studied, have not gotten into trouble, and all they want to do is study and work. Barack Obama gave them DACA, which really is nothing. It gives them two years that they're allowed to work, and that's it. After two years, they have to renew. After two years, they have to renew. After two years, they have to renew. Trump tried to stop that program. The federal courts came in and said, no, you're doing this out of sure spite, racism, and discrimination. We're not going to allow you to stop it. It is now before the Supreme Court, that decision for the Supreme Court to decide whether DACA will be allowed to continue or not. We expect to have a decision probably by June 
of 2020. So everybody that is with DACA come June of 2020 will know whether they'll be able to continue to renew or whether they will be undocumented again, because that is the correct term, not illegal, undocumented. Entered without inspection, you're here, you're now undocumented. You came in with inspection on a visa and you didn't leave when you were supposed to, you are an overstay. These are the correct legal terms. It's important to use the correct legal terms in everything, in every part of your life. If you don't know what they are, educate yourself about them. Uh, in the PowerPoint that I've prepared, which is much more in depth than what I've gone into today, which is gonna be handed out to you guys later, my phone number and email is at the end. Anytime you guys have any questions, anything that you wanna know, anything that you're curious about, reach out to me, let me know. I will be more than happy to answer your questions, okay? All right, I was told that I have to stop. So I'm, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna stop. Welcome. I'm just going to um, turn this off. Okay. So um, our next speakers are advisors of SCOPE, Elena Alice, and Leah Garcia.